Please join me, everyone, in welcoming our presenter, Nicole Conway. Nicole Conway is an advocate, author, motivational speaker, plus size model, and wardrobe stylist image consultant. Nicole is a natural encourager and motivated to all those that comes in contact with her. Nicole's fashion business, Coco's Image, was birthed through the personal testimony of depression and struggle. Nicole is a mental health advocate, certified through NAMNI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and shares her story through public speaking and in NAMI support groups. Her journey has led her to building others up from low self-esteem, low confidence, love of self as well as self-worth. You can learn more about Nicole by reading her bio in Hoover. Now, let's enjoy the presentation. I'm excited and looking forward to it, and I'm sure you are as well. We'll be back together soon for the Q&A. Nicole. As my session description says, I will be sharing my journey as a mental health advocate, but also my journey through mental illness. As stated in my bio, I am a mental health advocate. I have suffered three nervous breakdowns between the ages of 24 to 35. Throughout those periods of time, I did spend time in a mental health institution. Uh, the first two were private institutions. The last one was Show Creek where I spent the majority of my time. During my last stay uh, at Shoal Creek Hospital, I spent two weeks and I was admitted into the PICU, which is the Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit. Um, it's used for acute crisis, crisis as well as those who may uh, be wanting to harm themselves. During that time, I did give up on life and I had thoughts of suicide. Um, it first started when I went to my mother and I told her that I didn't want to do life anymore and if she would keep my children. And of course, she went on alert. Uh, she reached out to Show Creek and they told her to bring me in and they did an evaluation when I got there. Uh, with my consent, I stayed and was admitted. Um, that was the scariest day, of, one of the scariest days of my life. Although that was a scary period, it was vital for me to get the help that I needed so that I could continue to care for my children. Giving up on life was not um, giving up on life was not the final place for me to be. I had to get back. I had to fight like hell to get the care that I needed while I was there. The final thing that happened for me to be placed in the hospital. Um, was one night I was at home and I was going through one of my moments of uh, not wanting to be alive. My children were asleep and I was up and I went into the bathroom in the dark. And at that time I had very low self-esteem. I didn't love myself. I didn't want to see myself in the mirror. I didn't think I was pretty enough. And I compared myself to everything that was around me. You know, you see things in social media and you just feel like you don't add up. Um, and then also just family dynamics. So I was in the bathroom and my hair was much longer at the time and I had a pair of scissors. I was standing over the sink and I was literally cutting all my hair off, um, which led to my hair being a lot shorter now, but I like it this way. But at the time, I didn't understand what the connection was. Uh, but I cut my hair off. So I, when I went home, there was a sink full of hair and I didn't understand why until I thought back of what happened. I also realized the reason that I did those things in the dark because I didn't think I was good enough. I thought I was ugly and I didn't want to see myself. I didn't want to see my reflection in the mirror. So I went in the bathroom all the time in the dark. While I was at the hospital, I noticed that I did the same thing. I didn't want to see a reflection. I didn't want to see a mirror at all. Also, during the time of my stay in the hospital and when I got out, I realized that I had trigger months. 
And my trigger months were from October to January, starting with my birthday, ending with the new year. And I guess the association of all of those holidays and being happy and the celebration that you see all these families and these couples with, I didn't see that for myself. And I so wanted that for myself and my children, and I was very lonely. So during those months are when um, I had the hardest time. To get more information about triggers, please read uh, my Whova profile. I put an extensive uh, definition there, but I can give you a short definition of what that is. Triggers are external events or circumstances that may cause uncomfortable emotional or psychiatric symptoms such as anxiety, panic, discouragement, despair, or negative self-talk. During my stay at Show Creek, I literally felt like I was fighting demons. I was hearing voices telling me that I had a choice to pick my mother and father who had just been diagnosed with two forms of cancer or to pick my children. And if I didn't pick one or the other, that I was never going to get out. So that alone was like torment in my mind because I never wanted to make a choice between two sides that were so important and vital to my growth and just my pure existence. So that was very hard for me to figure out how I was going to maneuver making a choice between the two. That's not a place that you ever want to come to. I remember one particular visit when my parents came to visit me. I think I had been there maybe a week or so, and they brought my children, and it was my two children and my mother and father. And I know I looked horrible at the time. I had given up. My hair was choppy. Um, maybe, maybe yes or no taking baths. I just felt like death at the time. But when I saw them, I saw a light around them. Um, they looked healthy. They looked like they were going to be okay. And that was just the confirmation that I needed to see in order to keep pressing to get into a place where I was going to heal. My father told me at that time that he had been in places like Show Creek before and that I, didn't, I was not supposed to be there and that I needed to get myself together and get out. At that moment was the light came on for me in a sense. I fought like hell. I spoke to the doctor and I asked him to um, decrease my medication um, so that I can get to a space where I felt like I had some type of control. I remember there being a gentleman in there that I feel like he was my angel. I, after I started my medication and it was lowered, I would get up and he would sit down. He would eat lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when he sat down, I followed everything he ate on his plate. I, it was almost like, a, I felt like a robot. So if he picked up a piece of bread, I picked up a piece of bread. He drank milk, I drank milk. And it was like, it was a ritual. We had no words that we would ever say when we sat down. We just sat down at the same time, ate, and then we got up and we left each other. Me and him really never, ever had words, but it's almost like he was placed there to watch over me um, during my time. There was one dream that I had. I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, but I know God gave it to me because it was a dream of light. He showed me a peephole in a door. It was just a tiny little hole, and I couldn't see my body. I couldn't see where I was, but I could look out through the peephole, and I could see myself that I was on some type of platform. And there were thousands of people looking back at me and they were listening to me or waiting for me to speak. And I kind of backed off of the peephole, like, why are you showing me this? Like, I'm in a mental institution. No one wants to hear me talk. But later I had to realize that what I was seeing is where I was going. He showed me a vision of the things that I will be doing. I just couldn't see it at that time because at, I was hazy, I was foggy, I wasn't in my right mind, but in hindsight, it gave me so much to look forward to when I left the hospital. The other thing is I remember when we finally had an opportunity to go downstairs and stand out like on, there was like a, a patio that was enclosed. 
but there was light at the top that you could see. And I remember standing outside and the best feeling in the world was the sun hitting my face. I knew God was the in that and he was watching over me and protecting me and letting me know you're okay. So before I left the hospital, I promised him that if you get me out of this hospital, I will help everyone that you send my way to help them back into the light. Because basically you're in a dark space and you never know when you're going to get out. And somebody needs a little light in order to come out of that. I share my story because I don't take anything that I do for granted. I know the things that I endured were not for me. They were for the people that I come in contact with, the people that inbox me or email me or phone, send me a phone call. And there are many times that I still deal with uh, mental health and mental illness, should I say. Um, people will reach out to me. And I literally put those things to the side because I know they were sent to me for a reason. There was actually a time in my life where I felt embarrassed or I felt judged because of what I was going through. It wasn't, uh, mental in, illness was not something that was popular, that you hear a lot of people talking about at the time. And I just did not understand what it was that I was going through. During those times, I felt like an outcast. Um, I was attending a few different churches. And when I did go in the hospital and my mother reached out to those churches that I, I was going to, um, she asked that the pastor or somebody from the church would come and check on me and either pray for me or just see how I'm doing. And I never heard from those people. Not to say that all churches are like this, and I'm not putting a... Um, bad stamp on churches, but I really just don't believe that they knew what those things were. Usually they would cover it up by, why don't you come to the church so we can pray over you, or that maybe this is a, you know, this is a spirit and we need to get this out of you. But it's not a spirit. It is a chemical imbalance. And that's not something that you control. You are not crazy because you have a chemical imbalance. Was I judged by others? Yes. Did I lose some people along the way? Yes. And just like I said about the church, I just don't think that they understood what I was going through. And it was hard for me to describe what I was going through to anybody. Um, if you were to share some of those stories or the things that you went through in the hospital, people would think something's really wrong with her and we probably should send her back. But these things were actually happening to me. So now I'm very transparent with the things that I talk about, and I have no problem with worrying about if someone's going to judge me. My last breakdown happened over 20-something, 20 20-plus 20 years ago, and I'm still standing. Matter of fact, I'm standing stronger than ever. I wrote my first book in 2017, Coco's Chronicles. You can find it on Amazon. I am now certified through NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, as a facilitator in several of their programs. You all may not remember me, but in 2018, I was the motivational speaker for the conference in 2018. At that time, it was a scary process. I didn't know how I was going to be received. But once I got on the stage and I started interacting with the crowd, it was as if I received my wings. I was finally able to openly talk about my story and to share without judgment. Since then, I have blessed, been blessed with many opportunities and I take none of those for granted. So navigating through this pandemic has been quite an obstacle for me. I am an extreme extrovert. I love people. I love connecting to people. I love going to events and talking and getting to know new people. So this pandemic has been, um, it has been kind of hard. So staying at home, trying to figure out Zoom, trying to figure out, uh, well, what am I going to do for myself in the house? The first week I was cleaning up things and purging things and getting rid of things. And it was just getting used to being at home and it being my new normal. However, staying at home can be kind of hard being an extrovert 
I had to find creative things to do in order to keep me from slipping back into darkness. Um, it's easier said than done how um, once you say you, you conquered something, things on TV, the news, social media, a lot of those things pour into what you see, what you put into your mind, and how you react to them. So the things that I started doing to get me out of that space, um, I started walking and listening to motivational people speak, um, Christian music, um, and walking seemed to be very good for me because I was outside, I was getting vitamin D, I was in the sunshine, and like I told you before, the sunlight on your face just does something to your body. It lifts your spirits, it, it increases your energy, and you just feel good and you feel rejuvenated. So one thing I did was I purchased some coloring books. Yes, I purchased some adult coloring books, crayons, colored pencils, markers, um, just so that I could sit. Sometimes you have to do things that you don't have to think a lot about. And basically, it was trying to keep myself from coloring in the lines. I remember as kids, we would always try to figure out, well, if you color outside the lines, then it's messy. But even as an adult, sometimes we do color out the lines. So what? So get you some coloring books and keep them away from your kids. That is the best feeling in the world because basically you're taking care of the child that's inside of you that has dealt with a bunch of trauma. I also did a major purge in my house. Uh, my closet is always my issue because I am a wardrobe stylist. So now I try to get things out of my closet as soon as possible that I know that I'm not going to wear, whether I give them away, um, if I'm having a sale, something, or even on Poshmark. But I get rid of those things because purging is major. I say purging because we tend to hold on to things that no longer serve us. And we hold on to them for too long and they just collect dust, just like things in our lives. I did a live before, or maybe it was a YouTube video, where I talked about the relation between having a cluttered closet in your mind. If you think about how cluttered your closet gets or how messy you allow your bed to get, it's almost a direct reflection of your mind. Because when you go back into your room, it's like, your thoughts and everything you're doing is all over the place and you're trying to focus on one thing. So even if it is taken step by step, making your bed one day, I have been making myself get up as soon as I get out of the bed and making the bed because when I come back, then it's, it's set. I don't have to worry about straightening the blankets out and I feel more organized in doing that. I then began to start organizing my cabinets, getting rid of stuff. We just moved to New York a year and a half ago, so we don't have a lot of things. So it's good because I'm able to keep more of a control over what we need and what we don't. So I'm not a minimal, minimalist by any means. I love things, if you know me. Um, but it's just keeping a track and organization in your home. The biggest thing for me is journaling. I don't do it every day. Um, if I have a dream that I remember, I write it down. Um, when I read my Bible, or if I read something that's inspirational, I write it down because I can use it for something else. Or if I'm having a hard time, I can refer back to it. It's good to journal and to make sure that you put dates in there so that you can refer back to that at a later time once you have grown and done some work in your life. It makes a huge difference. It's not so much to go back and say, oh, woe is me. It's more so to peek back on all the things that you have accomplished since you wrote in it last. This, well, not this year. Last year, we had a major loss in our family. My mother passed due to heart disease. And me being here in New York was hard trying to have uh, closure with that. I did have um, some special time with her before this, a month before she passed, I went back to Texas and I spent three weeks with her in the hospital every day, making sure she was okay. And those were very special moments. But then coming back and because of the pandemic, not being able to do a proper burial for her immediately 
because we didn't know if it was going to pass or pass or not. Um, having mental illness and losing a loved one and being far away is very hard for me because you can't be there with your family to mourn. You have to find ways in order to mourn on your own. And it's very hard. You have to do a lot of talking, get into some type of therapy and surround your people, surround yourself with people that are going to support you. It's hard to lose someone at any time of your life, but it seems to be a little harder during this pandemic. It also doesn't help watching the news every day and seeing the numbers go at an all time high. Um, the visuals of them loading people in trucks. Um, it's just a lot to take in. Find ways in order to not see those things by turning the TV off, disconnecting from social media. So I also posted on my slide different things that you can do to lift your spirits, even though you may be far away. You may be in the same city with your family and friends, but you can't go because to see them because of this pandemic. Um, create Zoom calls, family Zoom calls, where you have as many family members that want to participate. Or maybe you want to do a double date night with another couple. My husband and I do that from time to time. We'll cook dinner and then we'll hop on with them and we'll have a double date night. Um, do family group calls. Reach out to people that you haven't talked to in a long time. Um, I know that being far away, we don't get to see the family that we like to all the time or, or that we were around. But there's also family members that I have in other states that I don't get to talk to on a regular basis. So I have made myself reach out more, call, text, but it's been, I've been trying to call more because it's easier to connect with them that way. Once again, do not forget as a professional to make sure that you document the proper session of, for this session so that you will receive your proper CEU. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope I said something to inspire you to awake whatever that is inside of you that needs to be worked on, whether it's going to therapy, getting some type of medication, um, whatever it is you have to do for self-care is so important. Just because you fall down does not mean that you can't get back up. This is Nicole Conway. Make sure that you take care of yourself first, each other next, and don't forget to govern yourselves accordingly. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Let's start our Q&A session. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If you'd like to speak, you can raise your virtual hand. We would love to hear your voice. Um, and you'll be unmuted so you can share. Remember to put any questions for our presenter in the Q&A box. Thank you for being here. And so, Nicole, we have a question. At what point on your journey did your modeling begin? And um, what was oh, the sorry. inspiration? No, that's okay. And what was the inspiration? <laughs> uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, my modeling started when I was trying to discover who I was. I was trying to figure out um, who I was as far as my self-esteem, not feeling good about myself. So I joined this group called Curve Appeal, which was a plus size modeling agency, not really an agency, agency it was more of a sisterhood. Um, and we had different uh, groups around United States and different states. So once a year we would come together um, and we would motivate each other, show each other how to walk properly on the runway. Um, dressing, proper foundation, the whole nine. So it was more so everybody coming together to build each other up. So it started from there. And I use that as a platform to help other women that have problems with self-confidence or self-esteem issues. Awesome. And what, what, was, what inspires you? What inspires what you to do what you do, to just do what you do and do you? Well, um, I grew up. Uh, in Austin, Texas, and I had a bully. 
Uh, so I moved from Seattle, Washington, when I was 10 years old with my mother and my sister. When I came, the kids would talk about me and said I was too proper. Um, I had these big glasses on with this flipped hair. I played the flute. I just didn't fit in. So I went to um, a predominantly Black school, and I just didn't fit in. So I had my first fight there. I had a bully that followed me around all the time. And People don't realize, but that really plays a part in who you are as an adult now. You don't think it does, but it really has, um, it messes with your self-esteem. You're not feeling worthy enough or good enough. And then I also compared myself uh, to my, well, I, what, I didn't compare myself. People in my community compared me and my sister. We're total opposites. We look totally different and they compared. And unfortunately we do that a lot in our community. Well, after I just, broke out, it was over. Like <laughs> I wasn't staying in that place anymore. Um, after that last visit to the hospital, I realized at that point that I didn't go through that for myself. I went through that for all the people that God was gonna send me. And like uh, one of the presenters earlier said, I don't know what your belief is. I know my belief. So whoever comes to me, regardless of your belief system, I will always, um, find a space to be there for whoever it is that needs me. So at that point, when I got out, it took a long time to get back to who I was or who I was becoming. But once I got there, it was all gas, no brakes. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> so for the ministers, um, pastors out there that are listening, what would you say to them? And if, if they're in denial that, uh, members of my church, they're fine. Everybody's doing good. We don't, we don't have that issue here. What, what would you say to them? Um, if you are not equipped to knowing what, what mental illness is, and that is just a disease, just like anything else, any other disease that you hear that's out there, it's not a spirit. It is a chemical imbalance. Um, we can't control it. It's not something that you can just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm good again. I still suffer from times. I still have days that um, I don't want to be bothered. And because my spouse understands and knows what I go through, he gives me that space to, you know, some days you just want to have one of them days. So to me, if you're not equipped with uh, knowing what it is or the background of it, I think that churches should get more involved in finding out more things about it, making sure that they have people in their uh, church that know about it that can help. And if they don't have those people knowing the resources that they can refer out. Awesome. Let's see, we have a raised hand. Sorry, I didn't no. know if you were calling on me or not, sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so I really didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much for saying that because um, I am uh, dual diagnosed, um, but uh, like the whole time I was growing up, that's what we heard in my household mm -hmm. about the, the spirit and pray it, pray it up off of them. But it wasn't until I actually started going into out of treatment centers and things like that, that I learned about a chemical imbalance, like mm -hmm. something else is going on in my brain. You know what I mean? Because I thought something was wrong with me, but I think that is really great for you to say what you said about the church. I actually... <laughs> I believe in God and I love God and I know that's who wakes me up and who has gotten me through everything that I went through, but I've walked away from certain churches because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for saying that. Absolutely. And I'm not, and I didn't say that to, please don't take it wrong. I didn't say that to condemn the church because I say that a lot of the churches just don't know. They were not equipped at the time that I was dealing with. This was over 20 something years ago. Now, at this time, they do need to become equipped so that they can help and not just send you off because there's a lot of X everything in the church. And there's a lot of X, there's a lot of church hurt because of that. People don't return to churches because mm -hmm. of that. But mm -hmm. don't let that block you from whatever your relationship is with God. 
Oh no, I believe in God and I go to church. I just walked away from a certain no, I understand certain <laughs> church because mental illness wasn't it was it was just like what you said. Even though that was over 20 years ago, you still see it happening in churches mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. It, you know, so and it's um it's a sad thing. Um, but I'm just want to say thank you for sharing your story. And Absolutely. I really appreciate you saying what you're saying. I think this is so awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. So Nicole, from your perspective, what is it about social media that makes you feel you need you need to avoid it, particularly during the pandemic? Um, because not only on TV, but on social media, there's a lot of negative people on there. I'm, I'm not saying anybody that's listening is negative, but there's a lot of negative things that you see on social media. So if you don't see it on the news, social media will definitely let you know what's going on. You see when, as you're scrolling, you see child found here, dead in trash can. You've, and, and it's just, it's a, it can be a trigger, period. Um, there's a lot of people don't sometimes realize what their triggers are. And you could see something and that could just spin you out and you don't understand what's going on. But understanding what your triggers are, knowing when to turn it off. Yes, social media, I use it for a positive platform, but everybody doesn't use it for a positive platform. So it's just being careful of what you take in with anything, TV, radio, just in general. And social media, it has become a beast in that area. Absolutely. So Nicole, you mentioned triggers. How did you find out and learn or dis- and discover what your triggers were? Well, I remember there was some things as a child and when something would happen, like currently if something would happen to me or if I had a conversation with somebody, I would really sit with it and I always examine myself first before I address a person. So I always see where I am in, in the situation where I'm wrong. And then I think, and then at that time, things start coming up. They start bubbling up. And it's like, oh, this sounds like when I was a kid and X, Y, Z happened or when this happened. So it's kind of, you kind of correlate those two and they become a marriage. And you're like, oh, so that's why I deal with it. And then speaking up about to the person, I don't appreciate that. I don't like how that made me feel because this is what happened as a child and this is what's happening now. And I and you have to express your feelings. If not, just like what she said, Chanel said before, you suppress that stuff and you go to church and you put on that great smile and you don't talk about it and it blows up in your face and you don't understand why, which leads to the mental breakdowns. So getting in touch with your triggers, really paying attention to what bothers you the most and why it bothers you when you can go back to it and you say oh that's why that bothers me great thank you someone has their hand up (laughs) can you hear me yes Yes. hi hi (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> technology is something else it first, is <laughs> first let me say nicole you are amazing your passion everything you do with nami and as a mental health advocate i admire you you inspire me we at nami i am the deputy executive director of nami central texas and Nicole is just a gift to the community. And I just, we just wanna say thank you. And I also wanna offer another resource. If you have a faith leader or a church, anyone that you know, we are offering a program that is especially designed for faith leaders called Bridges to Hope. Hmm. And we have an upcoming one, um, former NFL player, Will Matthews and myself is gonna be leading this session for faith leaders at the end of February. It's free. You can go to namicentraltx.org, namicentraltx.org, and you can register for Bridges to Hope. But this is our way of bringing faith leaders into the circle of understanding what it is. Just 
just a little bit real quick, and I don't want to take too much time. My mother was an ordained minister diagnosed with schizophrenia. I'm a care, I was a caregiver for her. And part of my dilemma was I didn't know how to differentiate between scripture and getting help. And was there a parallel? And so we will touch bases on how can faith leaders empower their congregations and be a part of the community that helps support our community in uh, getting connecting to resources and help. And it's called Bridges to Hope. So thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing. We appreciate all that you do. And I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thank you, Dr. Q. I'm gonna call it Dr. Q because I know it personally. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have to say that you have, you were part of the reason why I did do a lot of the work that I do now. And previously, because when you came and spoke to our church years ago, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to be doing that. So I thank you for that. I appreciate you. Awesome. And yes, Nicole, you are amazing. Yes, thank you, you are. I, appreciate I echo that. that. I support that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. So another question, what is one of your favorite accomplishments? I'm excited about this question. <laughs> my, one of my favorite accomplishments. Um, I mentioned in my video where I had to address Central Texas African American, the, the conference three years ago. Well, it was the first time I got in front of a big platform of people. I was nervous as I, I don't know what, I, I can't even explain how nervous I was that day. But after I got on stage and I started talking, I just felt like I got my wings and I said, it's over now. So that to me was a great accomplishment for me. That's what jump started what I'm doing now. And I'm just really grateful for that opportunity. Awesome, that's awesome. So what would you say um, to individuals who um, want to tell their family members what's going on, what they're experiencing in terms of mental health? I think it's very important that you speak to your family members. Um, I had someone come to me before and said that she did not want to speak to her family members because she felt that they were going to judge her. But it gets to a certain point where you get tired of feeling the way you feel. And if your family members are not the ones that you need to reach out to, you should reach out to your support group, the people that are always there to support you and ask them, can you help me to get to a better space? Um, but keeping it in is not getting, getting us any better. As a Black community, it is not getting us better, you guys. I repeat that. We have been quiet too long, and we don't talk about what's wrong with us because we were brought up to believe, oh, we're strong people. We're not supposed to go through that. We're resilient. It has no color. Mental illness has no color. So you should speak up. I don't care who it is. Speak to someone that you trust that can help you to get to a better space. Because if not, you'll just keep repeating the cycle. And if you have children, you pass that generational curse onto your children. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Very sound words, um, certainly. So what would you, what are your thoughts when it comes to the future of COVID <laughs> as, yeah, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that? Like how should people be thinking about the future of self-care, mental health care? I think self-care is like the top thing. Every day I find something to do for myself. Um, even if I told a friend the other day, if you have to get a dry erase board, that's a calendar, you know, they have the ones that are a calendar and you write on it every day, what you want to do, you have to commit to yourself that you are going to feel better each day. Even those days that you, cause I always say, sometimes I'll just have one of them day, them girls days where I'm not wanting to be bothered. And I just tap out. Is it okay to have those days? Absolutely. Don't let people tell you, girl, you crazy. I don't know why you laying around. If you need a day, take a day and don't let people tell you anything different. Um, finding ways, even though we're, our, we are stuck at home, you have to find different creative ways to feel better. This is not our as back to normal. You know, we, they said, well, after this is over, we're going back to normal. 
this is not normal. None of the things that we are enduring right now are normal. So the things that we're going to do after this are not going to look the same. We'll be walking more. Hopefully we'll continue the things that we do for self-care after COVID, walking, writing, uh, contacting family members we haven't talked to in a long. And I meant that. I did buy me a, an adult coloring book. And you see got markers in here, just like for the kids, this mine, okay? I bought the colored pencils, the markers, buy what you, you need to buy. Because if you really think about it, the person that suffered the most was that child inside of you. Go swing, girl, I can't wait till this snow go away so I can go swing. Go swing, kick the kids off the swing, whatever you gotta do. But you have to do things that are good for yourself. Getting up every day, throwing your sweats on, not combing your hair, not wash your face, brush your teeth. You know, the normal things that we do every day. Those are the things that you have to do even more now. Brush your teeth, wash your face, make your bed up, start cleaning up your room. It's not all gonna happen overnight, but if you do things gradually, you'll get a rhythm and every day it'll be something different. So when your closet looks crazy, guess what? It's a reflection of up here. Everything is out of order, so is my closet. So I look at my closet and I'm like, I need to get myself together. Taking F some top baths, walking. There's just so many things that you can do. This is not the normal anymore. Well, it, it will be the new normal, but moving that into daily, every day, I have to do something for myself so that I'll be okay. Because there's not always gonna be someone that you can call on. Great, thank you. Um, we see, I see that we have a hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask Miss um, Nicole. I guess you're not in Austin since you said snow. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, how can I connect with this woman? Um, um, again, um, I was just going to get some pointers, but you, I guess you kind of answered it um, when you said about the closet and all, because I go through mm -hmm. that. But I see, like, when I, if I don't address, my issues like I do see it like she, my daughter starts to do the same thing mm -hmm. like with her room her room and being um like out of order and then I was I I would get on her and then I would be like wait a minute you know what I mean like, <laughs> <laughs> like but my room is raggedy <laughs> right right and so I was like so I, I so what you said made sense just this, um, I have to do things more. So again, thank you for sharing your story and things that you go through. Cause I sometimes be like, man, am I a bad parent? Am I, how can, what can I do so that my door, cause I, this is just sometimes how I talk. So my daughter won't be all messed up like me. Oh. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm a single uh, parent. Um, she lost her dad like five years ago. So I've been trying to, she hasn't yet to say anything or really express how she really feels about that. And so um, she's only 11. So I'm like, I don't want to project like stuff that I went through, mm -hmm. like as a kid on her. So do you have any suggestions about what I can do when I find myself doing that? So um, you guys are gonna laugh, but I have grandkids back in Texas and I'm on FaceTime with them all the time. So when my daughter calls, I'll ask them, are there any piglets in your room? And my oldest is very conscious of everything. She's like, what do you mean? I said, do you, is your room messed up? Is it nasty? Because if it's nasty, then that means there's little piglets in your room. And she'll go, oh my goodness, there's piglets in my room. So I'll call my daughter sometime and ask her, do you have piglets in your room? Because they're watching you. They are sponges. They pick up everything we do, even when we don't think so. So making sure that you do it before you ask her, because you are the leader in that house and she's watching everything you do. She's going to look at you and you're contradictory by saying, go clean up your room and mommy's room looks a mess. So it's really you doing yours first because she's watching you and then you checking her. But if you check her and your room is not, because you know, we grow up, you better do as I say, not as I do. But we have to change that. That's something we grew up with, but that doesn't mean it's right. You have to change that. So it's up to you. You set the, the, um, the cadence in your house of how it's going to go. This is what we're doing today. You go wash dishes because this is what I said. But your room, 
You need to do something in your room before you try to tell her to do it. Thank you. Absolutely. I see that there are other hands raised. We know that it takes a moment to get off mute. To myself. Awesome, we muted? can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nicole, um, for your presentation. I think um, one of the like most important things about how you presented um, your everything that you've been through in your life and just how mental health has impacted you was your ability to express to us what you actually did to come out of, you know, the mental health problem. I work in a crisis on a crisis team where a lot of times we are trying to like encourage people, hey, I know you're feeling depressed and you're having all these symptoms, um, but get up in the morning, brush your teeth, wash your face, do what's good for you to help you mm -hmm. through it. Um, and something that I, I sit through a lot of conferences and a lot of meetings and I, I hear about awareness, but I never really get to hear about, well, how do we pull them through it? And so I just wanted to let you know what you did was so important to mental health in general and just really helping people make it through what they're going through. Um, it's easy to talk about what somebody has. It's never easy talking about or even showing someone how to get through it. And so I think you did a fantastic job doing that. And I would love to see and hear more people like you um, kind of expressing what you did to come through, because I think it's important. Thank you That's so much I for that. Do. I appreciate that. Really, I do. Awesome. So Nicole, how, did, how were you able to get your spouse to understand um, your illness? Well, um, we were very uh, open about ourselves in the very beginning. Um, we didn't hold any punches. We told each other the whole, he told me his background and I told him my background. So before we even decided that we were going to date, that was out on the table. I didn't hold back anything. I think that's something that shouldn't be hidden because if something arises later on and the person is not equipped and they don't know, they may just say, you know what, I don't wanna do this. So I think it's very important to be transparent. If the person does not wanna stay, then that's not the person you're supposed to be with. So it's very good to voice your opinion, even when you are in a marriage or a relationship to share even afterwards. I mean, but it's good to share in the very beginning to me. Awesome. What would you say um, is the first place to start to find um, support groups? Um, there's, I'm so grateful that there's support groups out there. Um, like I say, I am certified with NAMI, um, but there's so many more places and, and just even asking. That's our problem a lot of times. We don't want to ask anybody because we don't want anybody to know. So opening your mouth and saying, you know what, I need some help in this area or Google is amazing. Like back in the day, we had uh, Encyclopedia Britannica and it didn't have none of that in there. <laughs> so asking and Google is amazing. There's so <laughs> many resources everywhere. So it's not like you can say, well, there's no resources because there's plenty of resources out there. And if there's somebody that you know that may know, ask. I mean, because my I keep my inbox is always popping. People always ask me, well, what do you, I will stop what I'm doing. I will find the resource for you because everybody needs a little help. Awesome. So great. Anybody else want to raise your hand? Put your hands in the air, waiting <laughs> like you just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, y'all? So what does it mean to be certified with NAMI? What does that process look like? So it, it, it takes some time. Uh, when I lived in Austin, um, it took, um, it's some, some of the classes are two day process. So you have to go in, they do a lot of extensive training. Um, you have to become, and then you become certified after it's over. So you have to go through a full day. It's like going to work. So it's usually on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, it's held at the Austin State Hospital. I'm not sure if they're still doing it there. But I started years back and right when I was about to actually get active in the classes in Austin, 
uh, we ended up uh, running for office, but that's a whole other story. So just getting um, connected with NAMI and finding out what classes are available if you are someone that needs the help or if you actually want to be trained to teach a class. So is that what certification means, being trained to teach the class? Teach the class or being a facilitator within a classroom setting. Okay. Um, are those classes free, certification free? The certification is free. However, uh, you have to become a member of NAMI and it's a very minimal fee to uh, sign up for it. Are there times you find that you're triggered? What do you do when you're triggered outside the house? Or maybe you're out in the public? What, do you, what are some things you do? Uh, for myself, I usually, um, if I'm outside, I usually come back home and I try to process it, whether it's writing it out or sitting with it to find out why this happened. And usually it's not you that is causing the issue. It may be somebody saying something or you may, it could be even a billboard you see that says something that may trigger you. So just coming home, um, I, I don't go out as often. Um, I run my errands and go to the grocery store, but still you guys don't know, but I live in New Jersey and there's a lot of crazy folks here as far as the way they, as soon as the light turns green, they're honking the horn. It's, it's a lot of things that can actually trigger you, but it's limiting the time that you go out when you go out and being able to deal with that because it's, it's a lot to deal with, even though we are in a COVID season. It's totally different here than it is in Texas. Well, I'm just looking at this chat box and how lit it is. Oh, it's <laughs> lit. It's lit. <laughs> and how people are saying how um, glad they are that they tuned in tonight. Oh, thank um, you, guys. And just have a little time. If you all want, somebody want to raise a hand. We got a hand up. We got a hand up. I we don't mind answering up. questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is Chanel again. I have one <laughs> question because I have the mental illness in my family and I'm dealing with it. Um, but sometimes how can I address like, um, so we're, I'm trying to reestablish a relationship with this family member. We were both raised in the same home. So we experienced a lot of the same things. Mine's manifested in one way, hers manifested in one way. Um, but I feel like when we talk, like I, we could be talking and the next thing I know, the phone is hung up and I won't hear from this person from like a month or so. And like, it's just like nothing ever happened. So how can I address that? Like maybe, cause you just said like, I could have said something that triggered this person. So how can I, how can we have a relationship? Like, do you have any suggestions? Because I, am at a loss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like so, I, I, go ahead. I, it's just like, you know, I, I just, I want to have a relationship, but I don't know how to help this person. Well, I will say this. If you have done all that you can, as far as reaching out to them and trying to talk to them, and maybe even the next conversation you have, you might want to say, is there something that triggered you that I said? It's, it's, about, it's about more than anything being transparent with each other. And if that person is not willing to be transparent and they're not willing to tell you, you can't force a relationship, period. As much as you want it and you try everything that you can in your power to make it work, you can't force it because guess what? You are gonna be the one walking around holding on to all of that and that other person is fine or you don't know, but it's communication and being transparent and telling your truth. So if you call them and say, look, I did, was there something I said? And then that opens the door. If they choose not to, then there's nothing you can do about it. You can't take on somebody else's issue especially if you're trying to clear things up. And if they, it gets to the point that they don't want to have that relationship, then you may have to sever that relationship with them. You can't force anything that is not supposed to be. And I'll give you an example real quick. My biological father has never been in my life. He's been like in and out here and there whenever he gets ready. Well, right when I turn uh, on my last birthday, when I turned 51, I called him, I found a way to get in touch with him and I asked him, did he want a relationship? He told me no. So I told him, I love you and I wish nothing but the best for you, 
but I'm okay with it. And I had to like really dig deep inside, but it was something I never really had. So I had to let it go because it was eating me alive. Most of my life, I let that fester and eat me alive. And you think about all the times that you have missed in your life of being happy because someone has basically controlled that area of your life. So I told him, bye. And I, I'm great. I love him, but bye. <laughs> You just have to get to that point in your life that you put yourself first. And I know people always say, well, you have to take care of everybody else. But what about you? I always say, take care of you first. Because if there's no you, then there's no one that you can't take care of anybody else. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> when it, I mean, when it comes to like the addiction piece, like I can help. But when it comes to like the mental illness side, I, I struggle with trying to help. Um, especially with someone so close to me. Mm -hmm. So um, I really appreciate that because that was the guilt. Like, oh, um, I get, oh no, you guys are, you know, family. You need to do this and do that. But I, I thank you for um, what you said. I appreciate that. You can give the gift of goodbye too. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the gift of goodbye. The gift of goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, wow. So how did you cope with geographic transition? Oh, my God. <laughs> so um, I was in, in Seattle, and we moved to Seattle, from Seattle to Austin when I was 10. I was in Austin for 40 years. 40 years, y'all. So when my husband got a job here in New York, we moved here and it was extremely hard. There were plenty of times I stood in this window um, in the front of the apartment crying like, Lord, why you got me here? This is not my, this is not for me. Why you got me here? Um, it was very hard. But when you have a spouse, you have to move when they move. When you move, I move just like that. So I had to learn how to be away from my children and my grandchildren and everything I knew, all my friends, everything I knew was in Austin. So I had to learn how to separate myself from that. But the good thing about that is that my children have grown so much because I'm not there hands on trying to fix everything. So everything happens for a reason. It was very hard. The temperature is totally different. Having to adapt to that extreme heat to extreme cold, um, dealing with the different attitudes. People here have major attitudes. I don't know what that's about, but I still walk in. Hey, how y'all doing? And they look at me like I'm crazy, but it's okay. I'm not going to um, lower myself and how I am because of people in this, in this area. Now, I've had a friend that lived, has lived here for many years and he told me, don't change who you are because they need it. So guess what? I'm going to sprinkle a little sunshine on all the people that got the little bit of faces and it's okay. So that's how. <laughs> so one thing you, um, you show to us in your, your presentation is that you have a YouTube channel. So mm -hmm. what do you use to talk about or what are your videos about? My videos are about just everyday subjects, you know, about moving forward, um, remaining positive, continue on. I mean, because a lot of the things that I talk on, on there connect with people are going through everyday life. I have some interviews on there um, and just make basically motivating people to feel better about themselves because we don't always have that outlet where we can reach somebody that looks like us that has gone through the same thing. Everything is so um, by the book and that's not at all what I'm talking about. It's not by the book. It's by my life experiences or people that I know that have gone through something. Yeah, and I want to just um, highlight and elevate a couple of things that I see in the chat is a comment that men struggle with separations differently. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're so, like, let's go. <laughs> we're like, no. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, so I don't know if, if there are there any more, anybody else that want to raise your hand? That's want to um, be. Don't be scared. I'll ask, yeah. answer your question. <laughs> Come on, she's here. We have her live, y'all. Live. This is live. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the video version of Nicole. This is Nicole <laughs> live, y'all. <laughs> 
your moment with Nicole. Your moment with Nicole. That's cute. (laughs) Well, if there aren't any hand raisers or any more questions in the chat, I want to give this time um, to Nicole, if you want to give us any last or um, final messages or or anything you want to say to us. I do want to say thank you all for joining um, my session because you didn't have to. You could have been on the other session or you could have been doing something else. I appreciate you listening. I always say take care of yourselves first. That is the most important thing that you can do for yourself. Um, find something to do each day. It's easy to sit around and do nothing, but, it, but it's easy during these COVID times to go into a dark space. Find somebody that you can connect with, that you can talk to, that you can trust, that you can share whatever it is you're going through. And don't feel that you are, as they say, you crazy girl. Don't feel that you are crazy because you're having an episode. Always try and find somebody to reach out, whether it's NAMI or the the prevention hotline, wherever, find something. Too many people are losing their lives every single day because they've just given up on life. I know because I've been there. I have wanted to give up so many times, but the only thing that kept me grounded were my children because I was, like Chanel said, I was a single parent raising two children by myself. And it was hard. It was very hard not knowing, you know, if the lights are going to be on when I come home. So find somebody that you connect to, can connect to, whether it's a sisterhood or a brotherhood. And I know men don't connect as well as women, but find somebody. There's always somebody out there that will help you. Um, my inbox is open if, if you need resources, if you need me to connect you with, with somebody, because I love to connect people. I love people and I love to see them in a better space. That's why I'm here. And that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to thank Nicole for sharing her knowledge and insight with us. And many, many thanks to all of you for joining us today. Please take a few minutes to complete the workshop survey. It helps us to know how we're doing. And if you're you're seeking CEUs, remember that your forms will be in the survey. So if you're seeking CEUs, remember that the forms will be in the survey and the links are in the chat. Nicole, once again, you know this already. You are amazing and fabulous. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Uh, You are so appreciated. We so appreciate you and your time and all that you've poured out to us. So I'm sure based on what we've learned and heard today, you're going to pour back into yourself. So thank you for being here. And again, we appreciate you. Have a good evening, everyone. And we see you tomorrow. We're back again. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you.